a refugee camp after that. And so through a lot of um, amazing goodwill uh, good doers in Burundi, we were able to uh, find bus fare to take us to Rwanda. And when we get there, we also relied on strangers, um, just people <laughs> with kindness in their heart to help us. We ended up in a small apartment, but it was better than a refugee camp. Um, I'm not going to get too deep into my story because I want to talk about why I do the work I do today. We were resettled in 2007 in Rochester, New York, of all places. Uh, the coldest place on earth. Um, and I, I don't have to tell you, as you've heard, there are many challenges that face refugees when they're, they're resettled. Um, and it, it really is up to the local community. Uh, it depends, it, our success is very much dependent on you and how involved you are in our resettlement process. I was one of the very fortunate ones who had a very involved community um, that helped me. Uh, I had an ESL teacher that recognized my talent in the failing school that I was placed in and applied for a scholarship to a private school. The people like that who you know, put in that little extra effort um, and you know, get us where we are now. Uh, two years ago, I started the Jimberry Fund because I wanted to do something. I realized that I was here succeeding. I just wrote a, my memoir, which is doing well. Um, it's called How Dare the Sunrise. <laughs> but I was, I've been advocating for refugees ever since I got here um, through many different agencies here locally or globally. Um, and I realized that the people that were being forgotten were the people that were going back home to no opportunities. And that was the source of a lot of conflict uh, in, in the areas that we live in, that, that we work in. Um, so for example, the, the Hope Flats was in Minembwe. Um, because of the lack of resources, people are constantly fighting. And for what? Uh, the you know, it's so easy to come in and convince people to, you know, to hate each other and blame one another for the lack of resources. So what we try to do is provide the resources and hopefully that opens their eyes to say, hey, they do not, you're not really fighting each other. There's no reason to fight each other. You can work together and build your communities. Um, I can, I'm more than happy to talk to you about uh, what Jimberry Fund does during the break. Uh, but I just wanted to share with you the scope of um, the refugee experience. It doesn't just begin in the refugee camp and end there. It, it's everywhere. It's in the host countries, transit countries. It's in their home countries. It's here uh, once they've been resettled. The work doesn't stop, and our involvement shouldn't just begin and end in refugee camps. All right, thank you. HCR. Thank you for speaking on the concept of shared responsibility that came up a few times in your talk. I wanted to ask you your opinion on uh, the concept of shared responsibility and how to incentivize and motivate member nations and non-member nations to participate and kind of adopt the responsibility, since that is kind of a political issue. Yes, let's take a, a first round. If you have relevant questions, that would help. Or non-relevant. <laughs> so I, I, I think you can respond, and maybe your response will trigger further reactions. Oh, there is uh, something. I've heard about the 
you got to move the mic. I'm so sorry. Could you very, very briefly repeat the question? With the, With the microphone. My name is Yvette, and I just would like to know, um, I, you mentioned the importance of host communities. How do we get involved? How, how do we empower them? How do, um, there is a problem, where, where can we do the solution? Because I know that there's resistance um, among the communities, and how can we educate them so we can help no, that um, Is your question addressed to the panel? Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions? were not addressed. Like they just they, asked questions. Yeah, and they were not being addressed at all. That's because they're they were not. Oh, like oh, we collected a number of questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was so confused. Nobody's yeah. questions. Sorry about that. Like, like, questions. <laughs> okay. No, no. Uh, just to re respond. I mean, that's a that's an excellent question on how do you incentivize member states to act. Um, you know, I would say in the, in, the, in the context of these discussions, in many respects, there's a surprising degree of agreement by, you might call the global north and the global south, and the need for more predictable mechanisms um, for cooperation and, and for responsibility sharing. The sense that we would like <clears throat> to know what are the structures, and I didn't talk about some of the structures that are being in place, put in place for the global compact. What are the structures that are going to be put in place when a major refugee movement happens um, so that we know exactly how to come in and, and especially how do we bring in other actors? And those other actors include, for example, the private sector. It's a big other actor that people are talking about, um, as well as host communities. For some, um, perhaps not the best of intentions, there's an incentive to provide assistance to host communities um, with the hope that they are taken care of where they are, and they don't move on, uh, quite honestly. Um, and that has a good side and it has a bad side. Um, the good side, I think it, it is something that there's a strong interest both for, for good reasons as perhaps, well, self-interested reasons, is um, trying to ensure that if people have access to education, have access to livelihoods, they're not going to put themselves at risk um, to take it what we call an irregular movement, to move illegally where they're potentially going to be subject to abuse um, exploitation by smugglers. The flip side of that is to make sure, at least I think on the part of UNHCR and other kind of advocates, is to say that doesn't relieve you as a state. If somebody does show up, your international obligations to admit that person to your country under the 51 Convention still remains. So it's not an either or. It's a, you have an incentive, and if you can provide assistance and they don't undertake Dangerous journeys, that's great. But if they do decide to undertake those dangerous journeys, you still have obligations that are, that are there. So I think that there, um, that there are those incentives. I think also people are recognizing, especially if there is an incentive to assist host communities, if we can help refugee communities and host communities and rise the, rise the boat for everybody, then I think that there's an incentive there uh, in terms of development work that's taking place, in terms of conflict prevention, that there is a, a broader incentive that people see in terms of prevention of displacement uh, and prevention of, of human suffering uh, and prevention of, it, you know, the, what is it, a pound, uh, an ounce of prevention beats a pound of cure. So to the extent that you can invest in communities, even in an asylum displacement context, that can go a long way to to encouraging reconciliation and other things that will help uh, prevent ongoing conflict and displacement. So I'll stop there. Thank you.
we always believed in a bottom-up approach. So I think if you focus in finding civil society and listening to their voices, uh, then you're welcomed in that society to help them. So all of these groups that we work with around the world uh, came sort of asking for our assistance. But we very much come in with a mentality of listening to them and their solutions to their problems. So I really believe uh, that's the way to do it um, more than ever. I think there's a lot of attention to uh, the UN and uh, the State Department in, you know, uh, from the top to uh, the bottom approach, which is also very important and needs to happen. But uh, I was talking to one of the students here, who was talking to me about UNFPA, who just ran out of funds, and so all those programs are suddenly, you know, gone. So if we focus in local NGOs and local civil society in countries like that, if funding runs out, at least they have um, the capacity and the strength to keep up with their programs and really uh, advocate for their own rights. So I just think if you want to help, uh, look for local groups on the ground, volunteer, uh, just come there, visit, share their stories, and I think um, you're empowering them uh, if you can do that. Any other questions? Do you feel your points uh, have been addressed? Yes. Um, so just in regards to how to engage locally, Interfaith Rise is in Highland Park. I googled it, it's 1.4 miles from here. <laughs> and um, so we have a public meeting the third Thursday of every single month at noon. Everyone is welcome to come. We, as the volunteer coordinator, we always are looking for volunteers for very specific tasks. And so if you're interested in engaging, um, please um, come to that meeting or you can look at our website, interfaithrise.org. We resettle 150 refugees each year and the need for engagement from the community um, is huge and crucial in the success of welcoming um, refugees into our community. So thank you. I just, uh, thank you. I thought that panel was fantastic, wasn't it? Yes. It was fantastic. You know, I, I went around and I saw your projects from your houses, and I'm wondering, uh, while you have a panel of experts here, um, whether any of you from any of your houses have specific questions on the topics around mental health or sexualities or so on and so forth. Here's your opportunity. Um, you've done a lot of excellent research, but now you have an opportunity to talk to people about some of the concerns that you have. Uh, so does anybody want to take a... Good. So, for the refugee women, how are their mental health needs being attended to? Do you want to address the question to the panel? Anybody can answer that question. <laughs> Um, 
All I can talk to you about is uh, the effect that embroidery and quilt has had on their mental health. So, as I was saying, we work with local NGOs, and in this case, this group is called the Collateral Repair Project. And so, um, the quilting project has a therapeutic side to it. So, just coming together uh, to share their stories and do the embroidery, uh, they've reported back to us that that has helped them with their mental state. Um, you know, they're coming from really dark places, and now at least they see other women who experience similar situations. So talking it through and putting it all into art has helped some of the beneficiaries that we have worked with. Yeah. Um, in terms of mental health, I think that's one of the ways we failed refugees. Um, and I'll, from beginning to end, I think for me, I never even, I come from a culture that mental health, it's not talked about, stigmatized. So we, what we went through when we got here, we didn't have, we didn't have, whether the Catholic family centers didn't have the resources to offer counseling or anything like that, but that's not something we had. I'm glad that it's changing and a lot more organizations are implementing mental health as, as part of um, resettling, resettling refugees. but. I didn't really deal with um, the trauma of the massacre until college. That was the first time that uh, a professor said, you might have PTS, you might be depressed, you might need to seek professional help. So that's something that I wish I could see more in, um, in all the, you know, the, the all the steps of resettling refugees or just helping refugees in, uh, in transit countries or um, internally displaced people. Yeah, so I, do, I wish I had more of an answer for you, but all I can say is that the more we talk about it, the more we talk about the importance of mental health, the more that these agencies and organizations are listening and implementing that and, uh, as part of their programs. Um, so at Interfaith Rise, people um, coming with PTSD, PTSD and trauma is um, huge um, amongst our clients. Uh, people that come, they have Medicaid. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been on Medicaid, but the mental health services on that are pretty abysmal. But um, so we have uh, this woman named Carol Turner, who is a um, psychologist who works out of our building, and so she's able to see clients um, immediately based on. Um, their need, and so she's able to see them directly, and then she can refer them out based on the need. I think the biggest challenge um, is, like you mentioned, that um, coming from different cultures, there's different cultural norms around addressing mental health, um, and so I think this is an er a problem that hasn't been fully addressed. Yeah, thanks. Uh, mental health is, is continues to be a major challenge. I mean, we're nowhere near where we need to be, uh, quite honestly. I think we're, we're making progress. I know that there are some operations uh, where there is a real concerted effort. Uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges, quite honestly, is money. Um, uh, oftentimes, you, you, you have funding that's maybe about 10%, 15% of what your needs are, and then the first place that this money goes is to food, shelter, water, uh, the basics. Um, but that said, I think, uh, especially in, in certain operations, we, and we work very closely with partners, and we usually have partners who work on issues of sexual and gender-based violence or, or gender issues, and they make efforts um, to provide places for women to congregate, to meet. Um, there is counseling that's available, things like art therapy, um, as a, similar to what was discussed before in terms of quilt therapy. So th there are programs that are there, but I think we're just scratching the surface in terms of what's needed. Thank you so much for um, the question and the responses, yeah? Okay, actually I have two questions. So my first question is, uh, with all the like programs and the things that you want, um, they're also like transgender refugees and like LGBTQ community. How do you specifically help those people um, who are refugees who come here because of the sexuality that they have? And my second question is, 
do you provide legal services for these people, especially if, like, if they're women or people who have experienced sexual violence? How do you legally help them, like, apply for asylum, or if they want to file um, a claim, or like, if they want to go, um, if they want to, yeah, if they want to, like, like, file a claim legally? Like, how do you help them go there, from like in the legal process? Um, any other questions? That did you have a question before? Oh me? Oh no, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. This is your last opportunity to engage with our phenomenal panelists. Hi, um, my name is Kaya Bojabar, and I'm going to be a Global Village student next year. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question in terms of sexual violence that occurs within refugee camps. Um, are there any initiatives, either within the UN or other civil and local organizations, that help address um, sexual violence that's either perpetrated by peacekeepers, as in um, as what happens in South Sudan, or um, other, other men that um, so for example, I, I read an article a few weeks ago about how um, men in some Syrian refugee camps are trading um, sex for food aid, or they're, um, they're demanding that women trade sexual papers in order to get food aid for their families. Are there any initiatives that you know of um, that are currently trying to address these types of issues on the ground? Um, and I think the questions are, we don't really have uh, too much time, but um, try to get. Okay, oh, thank you. Um, this is also addressed to the whole panel. Um, the Public Health House, um, we went to the Dominican Republic over winter break. Um, and in the Dominican Republic, um, we learned about political issues that were surrounding the citizens citizenship status of people of Haitian descent living in the Dominican Republic. Um, and so we had a lot of direct conversations uh, with communities um, who were not giving, getting the government services and support systems um, in their own communities. And so it was easy to see the injustice while we were there within the country. Um, however, now that we're back at home, how would you say we should, how can we continue to assist the communities um, from a distance, from a physical distance? Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. And I think the two first questions are uh, connected since um, transgender communities, in my experience, are um, the victims of sexual violence. Um, um, as well, so sure. I mean, I'm happy to start off. Um, on the LGBTI issue, I'll let other colleagues here and mm -hmm. talk about in the, in the U.S. Um, just to say, of course, this is a it's a very challenging issue depending on the country operation that we're talking about. Um, there certainly are um, uh, refugees who are LGBTI and who need protection, um, and the host community might not necessarily be the most receptive. Um, to who they are. And there are a number of organizations that work very closely. I know, for example, um, uh, Human Rights Watch, who, who try and set up operations to help uh, individuals who have claims or refugee status based on their sexual orientation find, first of all, find safe places to, to live and to be. Uh, and a refugee camp might not necessarily be that place. Uh, they might need to be living, for example, in an urban location uh, where they have an access to an apartment or something like that. And, Hopefully you'll have refugee programs that have those kinds of um, options in place. I, I lived in Ethiopia, I worked in Ethiopia, for example, and we had an urban program. That was a refugee, uh, a, a refugee hosting country where there was an encampment policy. And, and not all, that's a very important point. We often talk about refugee camps. The vast majority of refugees actually don't live in camps. Um, it's a different world today. But there are camps, and for example, in Ethiopia, if we had people who were particularly at risk, we would try withdraw them from the camps and try and enable them to live in, in an urban area. So the one first thing is physical safety. Um, the second thing is ensuring that they have access to refugee status. 
Uh, in some places, to be quite honest, having sexual orientation as the basis of their claim might not necessarily be the way that they want to go forward if they have another basis for a claim. Uh, it could be their, their race, their religion, their nationality, their membership of a particular social group. So they might not need to get status based on the claim, uh, but if they do, then it's, an, it's, it's certainly important both to make sure that they have the assistance that they need to go through the process, but also equally important to make sure that the government if it's a government or UNHCR that's adjudicating that, that claim, that they have the kind of training that they need to be able to assess the claim um, on its merits without necessarily bringing in social cultural norms um, into that equation. That's a challenge. Finally, I would say in terms of solutions, that it's not uncommon to find that somebody who um, has a claim based on sexual orientation, who is, who is gay or lesbian, transsexual, transgender, that, um, that they would need resettlement. Um, and that would be oftentimes a solution that you'd look at um, to, a, to a country where they could be safe. The issue of peacekeepers, survival sex for food aid, this very much links up with prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse, um, PSEA. There's been a lot of attention, or there was a lot of attention to it a few years ago in the Central African Republic because of peacekeepers who had abused boys and girls. Um, the current, at least within the UN, the current Secretary General has, has made this a very big part of his uh, administration. He set up a special coordinator who deals only with that issue. There's a zero tolerance policy for UNHCR. We have a zero tolerance policy, which means that we're also trying to ensure not only that UNHCR staff, but our partner staff um, are also being monitored to make sure that they're not asking for sexual favors for food, for assistance, which, which they should have by right. And of course, if, if those reports are received, if they are investigated, and they are found credible, then steps need to be taken uh, with regard to them. Peacekeepers, just to add, it is complicated because peacekeepers are actually falling under the jurisdiction of their, their, their government, the government that provided those troops, so France or, or other countries. So a lot of the responsibility also falls with them. Finally, quickly on Haitians, thank you for raising that. Uh, Haitians, uh, the statelessness issue is something that certainly UNHCR has been working on quite a bit. Um, I would certainly encourage you um, to raise it, I would say, with your, actually your local government officials to, uh, to say that this is an issue that we think is important uh, in terms of our foreign uh, relations, in terms of raising it with the Dominican authorities, um, but also to find out how you can join campaigns with NGOs that are working on this issue uh, to see how you can advocate to ensure that they have uh, a nationality and that they have a, a country that they can call their own. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Thank you so much. Um, we, we want to thank you for your comments, attention, and uh, inspiring um, insights. Now it's time for lunch. If you have any other questions you would like to address to our panelists individually, uh, please do so. Thank you very much. Okay, before you get to lunch, um, we, I know I'm standing between you and food, but the food's not actually in here because they need to bring it in. So if you all want to take a break, go to the bathroom, hang out outside for maybe five minutes, and then this half of the room goes to that side, this half of the room goes to that side, and um, thank you all. I have one more quick announcement that the Creativity House is going to be um, showing some displays during lunch. And then at 5.15 is the full display in the Mabel Smith Douglas Library with food. So please make sure that you go there about 5.15. But come back in here in about five minutes. You'll have lunch. And the book will be available after the keynote speaker for those who want it. <laughs> Thank you.